Good evening. Tonight, we join a group of aspiring adventurers as they begin a journey across the world known as the Legendary Dimensions. Three unassuming dwarven peasants are preparing to leave the meager hillocks of Spry Tower on a hunting expedition into the wilds. They hope to make a living for themselves off the bounty of the wilderness, but perhaps greater adventures are in store for the humble triumvirate. The wide world is a dangerous place, where little is certain. The hunting party is led by Stinthod Sanusmebtob, whose name means Auburn Blockade. She's a hunter equipped with a copper crossbow, ten copper bolts, a copper helm, and a copper buckler. She's also brought her trusty hunting dog, Sarvesh Mark City. She's a casual worshipper of Illid Courage Gleamed, the dwarven god of victory, and she's a member of the Coven of Dominion, a religion devoted to Illid. Stinthod is agile, has good focus and good analytical ability, though she lacks physical strength and couldn't carry a tune if her life depended on it. She's good with a crossbow, but lacks skill with melee weapons. Stinthod finds blind honesty foolish, dreams of mastering a skill, is assertive yet friendly, finds helping others rewarding, and is brave in the face of danger. The next member of the group is Einod Berterist, Earthen Rims, a bone carver who hails from Flare Machine, a nearby dwarven hillix. He's a casual worshipper of Asmel, goddess of wealth. Einod finds fairness to be completely disgusting and will cheat anybody at any time. He doesn't care about loyalty, has a greedy streak, respects the development of skill, yet thinks working hard is a waste of time. He's ruled by irresistible cravings and urges, and is slow to trust others. Einod isn't strong, agile, or tough, and lacks willpower and patience. But he has high social awareness, decent linguistic ability, and isn't the worst musician in the world. He has no skill with any kind of weapons. He's an adequate comedian, and he's a novice stringed instrumentalist. He carries a wooden nighthom, which is a sort of lute. He also brings with him his lucky yellow jasper cabochon, which he probably stole from somebody. Einod is in charge of the finances of the party, funding the operation by selling his bone crafts. Trusting the party's funds to such a greedy cheat is no doubt a source of unease among the rest of the group. But tough luck, he owns the only mule, so they need him to carry their kills. Einod has named his pet mule Shem Gallidipt. The final member of this happy band is a butcher named Besmar Aiton Lenlar, Hallbird. He's in charge of dressing the kills and preparing the meat the party collects from their hunts. Besmar the Butcher is from the hillocks of Throglaze, a ways north, near the elven forest retreats. Besmar isn't a member of any organized religion, but he is an ardent worshipper of Tomud Rapid Massive, the goddess of thunder and luck. Besmar respects the development of skill, considers Kraft's dwarfship to be worthless, and doesn't care about attaining knowledge. He's emotionally obsessive, forming lifelong attachments even when they aren't reciprocated, and rarely tries to assert himself in conversation. He has a sense of duty and likes to brawl. Besmar is agile, tough, and very strong. However, he's quite bad with words and lacks creativity, intuition, and social awareness. He's a decent enough wrestler and has some skill with an axe. Besmar is completely shirtless, carries a copper battle axe, wears a copper helm, and is carrying a bit of food for the party. He has also brought along his pet Cavi, a lath squeezing minds, who he couldn't bear to part with. These are Stinthad's most trusted companions, a fact which perhaps reflects poorly on her judge of character, and they're ready to make their way into the wilds to begin the hunt. They decide to leave this rather crowded hut they've gathered in and set out. Immediately outside the hovel is a statue, which apparently depicts a dwarf being elevated to the esteemed position of Exalted Gravel of a local religion. Odd name for a priest. Anyway, the hunting party journeys into the coastal forest, immediately east of the hillocks, in search of quarry. Stinthod leads the group while Einod and Besmar complain about the rain. But Stinthod hears something to the southwest. It's an impala. A fat one. Nice catch if we can bag it. It's recently been wounded by something, though. We should be careful. Whatever attacked it might still be nearby. We don't want to get jumped by a lion. Besmar, go check it out. Got it. Another impala to the west down here. I hear something else. It's your damn mule, Einod. You let it get loose now it's scaring off our prey. Get the thing under control. 
All right, okay, calm down. I'll get him. Here, Shemp. Here, boy. It's getting away. The situation is well under control. No, Shemp. See, I got him. Now try to keep your animal under control while I line up a shot. The flying copper bolt strikes the impala in the right rear leg, tearing the muscle and bruising the bone. A tendon has been torn. This is a fight. I laugh in the face of death. I not know. Take this! Damn it, get out of the way! The flying copper bolt strikes the impala in the right front leg. The impala falls over. Ha <laughs> ha! All right, that's enough of that. Oops. I'll dress the kill. Well, that went pretty well. We might have gotten a little carried away, but- I nod, listen to me. Your job is to watch the mule. Leave the actual hunting to the people who know what they're doing. Okay, I get it. That's enough excitement for me anyway. Now let's go see if any of the herd hasn't been scared off yet. The party finds the corpse of the fat impala, but have little luck hunting any of the others. Low on bolts, they decide to head back west towards the dwarven fortress of Crypt Taken in hopes of restocking on ammunition. The party arrives near the fortress. The group sets up camp. If they're going to resupply, they'll need goods to barter with. Besmar dresses the second Impala, while Inod begins carving the bones they've collected into trinkets. Two Impalas isn't a bad haul, you know. We're doing pretty well for ourselves. It's true. It's true. You know, guys, it's great to have friends like you two. And it's great to have a friend like you. Hey, let me see your axe. Hey, you're actually pretty good at that, Inod. That bone bracelet is exceptional. Well, I figure I should probably be doing something to make myself useful. Don't want you guys running off with Shem and leaving me out here to fend for myself. Hey, let's keep our options open. Very funny. Listen, I got a pretty good pile of merchandise here, so I'm gonna take Shem up to the fortress and hawk some of our stuff to the locals. Pack the extra meat onto Shem. I'll see if I can find a buyer. All right, you guys stay here. And leave you alone with all of our haul for the day? Oh, come on, come on, look at you. These are fortress dwarves. These people are put off by the common folk. We don't need an unwashed, half-nude, muscle-bound peasant scaring off all the buyers. It's better if I go alone. You're not exactly royalty yourself. Don't worry about me, I speak these people's language. I'm gonna have them eating out of the palm of my hand. We'll be rich in no time, you'll see. <sighs> Hang on, I hear something. Let's go check it out. Suddenly, a goblin swordsman appears in one fell swoop. It slashes Aloth the Cavi in half. Death is all around us. This is truly horrifying. The goblin stabs Stinthod in the upper body with his silver short sword, tearing the muscle and fracturing the middle spine's bone. A tendon has been torn. The confusion from this ambush leaves the party in disarray as they try to defend themselves. Stinthad tries to fend off the goblin swordsman, attempting to disarm him. He jumps away, tripping and falling down a small hill. Suddenly, Shem the Mule runs in and kicks the goblin swordsman, bruising the skin and bending the head. The goblin swordsman slashes Shem in the upper body, tearing the muscle and fracturing the middle spine's bone. Shem charges at the goblin swordsman. The swordsman is knocked over and tumbles backwards. The flurry of hooves and charges leaves the goblin dumbstruck. Besmar has reached the swordsman. Einod is still carrying his axe, so Besmar tries to get the goblin in a chokehold. Shem kicks the goblin in the hand, tearing apart the muscle and disarming him. Einod reaches the goblin and tries to swing the axe at him, but he lacks skill with a blade and it's a miss. Besmar struggles to get a good grip to strangle the goblin, while Stinthad picks up his sword. Einod continues to miss his swings with the axe. The swordsman bashes him in the leg with his shield, tearing apart the muscle and bruising the bone. Einod falls to the ground. As Shem runs off, the party is having trouble getting any hits in on the goblin. He's too well armored. Their weapons can't cut through the plate. Besmar takes a nasty hit from the goblin's shield, tearing apart the muscle in the left knee. It's not looking good for the party, though the goblin can't gain a decisive upper hand either. This brutal stalemate seems to last for hours, each party only able to bash at the other, neither able to land a decisive strike. 
But finally, after an incredibly protracted fight, the goblin passes out, utterly exhausted. The dwarves, tired and bloody, scramble to pull the unconscious goblin's shield and armor off of him. The goblin tries to regain consciousness, but it's too late. His head is exposed, and the dwarves slash and hack at him. Shem even returns to get another few hits in. And the mule kicks the goblin in the head from behind, the injured part exploding into gore. The goblin has been struck down. The dwarves lie bleeding, exhausted, most of them unable to stand. But there's no time for rest. The dwarves hear other goblins in the area. No doubt this entire fortress is overrun. They gather their things strewn about the ground and take the goblin's armor, then scramble back to camp. They can't stay here. If a single goblin was enough to leave them in this sorry state, they stand no hope of holding off the others. Despite their wounded state, the dwarves travel deeper into the forest, where they might be able to hide from the goblins. Much to Stinthad's dismay, her dog Sarvesh ran off into the forest during all the fighting. Better though that he escaped into the wilds instead of ending up like poor Alath the cavi. The dwarves find a nearby hillock where they'll be able to safely rest and recuperate. While many of their wounds were substantial, dwarves are hardy, and with some help from the locals, the party is rested and healed up come morning. The party awakens in the morning. Morale is low. With few words, they head outside to look for something to drink uncertain about how they'll proceed. But to their horror, another goblin raiding party jumps out and attacks Besmar. There's two elves, a goblin and a human, all armored. Perhaps they followed the party here from the fortress. The group rushes to try and save Besmar, but it's too late. A goblin hammerman bashes Besmar in the head, jamming the skull through the brain. Besmar has been struck down. There's no hope. The party is utterly outmatched. To stay here is death. They sprint away as fast as they can. Desperately thirsty, they stop by a river. Stinthad and Einod are unharmed, but Shem has been heavily wounded. Stinthad wonders grimly whether the mule will need to be put down. All of the food, crafts, and armor Shem was carrying were lost. Besmar died for nothing. The group has nothing to show for their efforts but death. The party's spirit is broken, but they have little time to process the death of their dear friend. They can't remain here. For all they know, the goblins are still following them. A short way to the east is a monastery, Dance Crests. Einod and Stinthad don't know what they'll find there, be it salvation or more death. But in their desperation, the pair don't know who to turn to but the gods. They find shrines with statues honoring human priests, but the two dwarves don't recognize any of them. A number of humans reside in a house to the southern part of the monastery, but they seem to have little interest in the dwarves. The only other place of note in the monastery is a shrine to a human god. This deity is foreign to the dwarves. Beside the statue is an altar, on which rests a single cryolite dodecahedral die, a divination die. These objects are said to contain powerful magics, which can impart great luck or great curses. Gripped by grief and with nothing left to lose, Einod snatches the die. He rolls, divining the will of the strange god of this place. It lands on an image of a weeping human. A sense of intense focus cuts through the fog of grief in his mind. He realizes the source of their misfortune, recklessly wandering into cities and villages without any information about the area. Perhaps if they ask around, they can find a dwarven fortress still under the control of their people, where they can find safety and hope. He leads the group back towards Spry Tower with renewed vigor, while Stinthad follows, despondent. They make their way to Spry Tower. Einod asks around, finding as much information about the surrounding area as he can. He learns that the Fortress of Crypt Taken was once a powerful stronghold for their dwarven civilization, the Eternal Attic of Skulls, but that the dwarves there uncovered some vast horror in the deep nearly two centuries ago. Goblins and all manner of other monstrosities ravaged throughout the fortress, killing all of the inhabitants. The hillocks they were ambushed in, fountain wilted, is often attacked by the goblin civilization called the Icy Seducer that has taken root in this region. Only fools travel to the fortress now. The dwarves were lucky to escape it with their lives. To his horror, Einod learns that every fortress from their civilization has suffered the same fate. The great strongholds the dwarves once prospered in are no more. 
The only thing left of their people are the dwarves of the hillocks, wallowing in poverty, cowering in fear of the numerous goblin fortresses surrounding them. There's nothing for the party here, yet they have nowhere to go. Any hope they might have had is shattered. And so, the party, having returned back to the very same hut they had set out from, lay down their dreams of adventure abroad, and retire back in Spry Tower. And with that, we take our leave of the hunters. What might befall them in the future? None can say. But the world is a vast place, peopled by many adventurers, some humble, some heroic, some nefarious. Come find me again some other night to hear more tales of the legendary dimensions.